Hi everyone, this video is part one of the 2A series titled Perception and Thought Processes from the Unit 2 Cognition series for AP Psychology students. This video lesson focuses specifically on two aspects of cognition, perception and attention. On this slide, you can see the complete outline for Unit 2. Notice that this unit is titled Cognition, and there is a lot of important information here. I've decided to break up this unit into two parts that I'm calling 2A and 2B. 2B will focus almost entirely on the topic of memory. The first part that I'm calling 2A will focus on other aspects of cognition, factors like perception, thinking, problem solving, decision making, intelligence, creativity, and achievement. Today's video will focus specifically on the learning objective 2.1 that's called perception in the CED. These are the key focus questions that will be covered in today's video. This will give you an outline of the major themes of today's video, and by the end, you should be able to answer each one of them. This is a list of the essential concepts related to the focus of today's video lesson on perception and attention. By the end of the video, you should be able to define and describe them. In psychology, cognition encompasses all of the mental processes involved with acquiring knowledge and understanding. These include things like thinking, memory, problem solving, decision making, creativity, intelligence, perception, and attention. In this video, I will focus on two elements of cognition, and those are perception and attention. Perception is a key cognitive process that involves organizing and interpreting sensory information. Attention involves focusing mental resources on a specific set of information, allowing us to prioritize and manage the vast amount of sensory information we receive. So let's start with perception. In unit one, you learned about the senses, specifically how sensory receptors in the nervous system detect information in our environment and transduce that stimulus energy into electrical impulses that can be carried to the brain. In this unit, we'll focus on the second part of that process, which happens in the brain, and that is perception. As you learned, perception is the process by which our brain interprets and organizes that sensory information. And normally, sensation and perception blend seamlessly seamlessly together, but separating them helps us better understand how we process this information. There are two main ways our brain processes this sensory input, and it is through either a bottom-up processing method or a top-down processing method. Bottom-up processing occurs most often when we encounter new or unfamiliar stimuli, usually things we have no prior experience or knowledge with. In this method, the brain processes the sensory information starting with the raw data before making any conclusions about it. For example, if you see an object that you've never seen before, your brain processes and analyzes the lines, the shapes, the angles, and gradually forms a perception. Let's use an auditory example. Suppose you're in a coffee shop for the first time and you hear a loud, unfamiliar noise. You're going to be processing the pitch, the volume, and the duration, and eventually you might identify the sound as a coffee grinder. This recognition is built up from the sensory data itself without preconceived notions. Top-down processing involves interpreting sensory information based on prior knowledge and experiences and expectations. This method is used when the brain encounters familiar stimuli and quickly draws on memory or context to make sense of it. For example, if you are a regular at a coffee shop, you might hear a sound that resembles a coffee grinder. Your brain might rely on past experiences and immediately identify it as such. But after turning to look, you might actually see that they've gotten a new smoothie blender. So your initial perception was shaped by the expectations, not the sensory input alone. So let me define these terms one last time before moving on. Bottom-up processing is a perceptual process that occurs when someone starts at the bottom beginning with the individual sensory information and piecing them together to formulate a conclusion. Whereas top-down processing happens when someone starts at the top, comparing the sensory information to ideas, expectations, and previous experiences that are already housed in the brain to make a quick interpretation about that sensory information. So let's focus on two concepts that can shape our top-down processing. They are schemas and perceptual set. Schemas are mental structures or categories that help us organize and interpret information based on past experiences and knowledge. They allow us to quickly make sense of new information by fitting it into existing categories. Schemas can be useful for understanding and predicting events, but they can also lead to biases or errors in our perception. For example, 
If someone has a schema for dogs that they are friendly, the individual might see an unfamiliar dog and approach it without caution. However, this schema or category could lead to a misjudgment if the dog is aggressive. Perceptual set refers to a predisposition to perceive things in a certain way. Essentially, a perceptual set acts as a mental filter in the moment, making us more likely to notice aspects of our environment and interpret them in a specific way. In other words, a perceptual set sets us up to perceive something in a certain way. On the screen are two examples of perceptual sets that will shape the way you interpret the images. Show a friend either image A or C, then show them the image labeled B. Having seen A or C first will influence how they perceived image B. This is a perceptual set. Seeing one of these images first will affect whether or not they perceive image B as a young woman or an older woman. Here's another example. In image D, there are two lines of symbols that run either up and down or side to side. If you were to focus on the horizontal symbols first, you would likely interpret the symbol in the center as B. This is because A and C acted as a perceptual set and thus organized the information in your brain as alphabetical letters. Whereas if you were to only focus on the vertical line of symbols, you'd likely first perceive the central image as the letter 13. This is because the numbers 12 and 14 informed your processing to interpret the symbols as numbers. This illustrates how the perceptual set can shape our interpretation of sensory input based on information or context. So in summary, schemas and perceptual sets are elements of top-down processing that allow us to quickly interpret sensory information. Schemas are categories that act like mental shortcuts to help us understand and organize general information based on what we've learned before. And perceptual set is a temporary situation or a mindset that makes us more likely to see or interpret something in a certain way based on our current situation or recent experiences. Perception can also be influenced by our experience, context, and emotions. There are many internal and external factors that can influence how we perceive sensory information. Here are a few examples. In 1973, a study by Gregory and Gombrich showed how people interpreted the visual image on the left-hand side of the screen differently based on their cultural backgrounds. Participants from West Africa were more likely to perceive this image as a family who was sitting outdoors under a tree with the woman who is seated balancing a metal box on her head. Whereas participants from Western cultures were more likely to perceive the image of the family sitting indoors with a window just above the woman's head. The cultural background is what influenced how they perceived the same image. Context can also influence how we perceive visual information. Take the two photographs on the right hand side of the screen. If you were to only see the first photograph of Simone Manuel out of context, you might interpret her expression as sorrowful or despairing, but in context, you would likely interpret this visual information really differently. If you knew that Simone was an Olympic swimmer who just won gold at the Rio Olympics in 2016, becoming the very first African-American woman to win an individual medal in swimmings in history, then you might interpret this photograph very differently. And finally, our emotions we are currently in can influence how we perceive stimuli in our environment. For example, studies have shown that people who are feeling angry are more likely to perceive neutral objects as guns. Or when participants are listening to sad music, they are more likely to interpret sad meanings of homophones. For example, listening to emotionally sad music um, influenced the way the participants interpreted words like die. They interpreted it as D-I-E instead of D-Y-E. And the word mourning as M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G instead of M-O-R-N-I-N-G. So experiences, context, and emotions can all influence the way that we interpret sensory information. So an element of perception is our ability to perceive whole objects instead of just a bunch of small images. For example, when you look at a tree, you often see the whole tree rather than the thousands of leaves, the many branches, the trunk, you perceive it as one image. And this principle comes from the idea of gestalt psychology. This was developed in the early 1900s and focused on how we see and understand whole shapes and patterns rather than looking at just the individual parts. Gestalt psychology highlights that our brain naturally tries to organize visual information into meaningful 
multiple groups. This approach differed from older theories on perception that focused on analyzing the individual sensory input. Just all principles that you need to be familiar with are closure, figure ground, proximity, and similarity. The principle of closure refers to our tendency to perceive incomplete figures as complete holes. And you can see that displayed on the screen. It appears that we see three boxes when actuality there are six brackets so there are gaps but our brain will fill those gaps in to allow us to see complete holes or squares the next principle is figure ground figure ground is also sometimes called figure and ground but this involves our ability to distinguish an object or the figure from its background or the ground and this principle helps us focus on the main subject of the scene while ignoring the rest in the background for instance when you are looking at the image on the screen you may focus in on the center object which might appear to be a candlestick or a vase and blur out the rest or your eyes might focus in on the two faces and not notice the image in the center. This principle is called figure ground. And then there's proximity, which refers to the way that we mentally group objects that are close together. Objects located near one another are often perceived as a group or a unit. And lastly, there's similarity. Similarity involves grouping objects that look alike. We tend to mentally perceive items that are similar, whether in shape or color or sizes, as belonging together. Together, these gestalt principles demonstrate how our perception is not just a passive reception of sensory information, but actually an active process that our brain tries to organize all of these units into meaningful, coherent wholes. By now, you've probably realized that we may perceive things differently than they actually are. And as you've come to know, external and internal factors may influence the way we interpret sensory information. Another factor that can influence our perception is attention. Attention is our mind's focus or what we attend our thoughts to. By one estimate, our five senses take in 11 million bits of information per second, yet we can only consciously process or attend to about 40 bits of that information. So what captures our limited attention? simply things that our brain deems important. This is what we call selective attention. Selective attention is our conscious attention that is focused because we are not able to attend to everything. Think of your selective attention like a spotlight that shines on whatever your mind is attending to in the environment. You can shift it around, but you can only focus on a few important things, not everything. A classic example of selective attention is the cocktail party effect. This is your ability to attend to only one voice within a sea of many voices, and yet then you can shift that attention to another voice in the room. Think of yourself as a party guest speaking to another person when you hear your name spoken by someone else in the room. You can immediately shut out the voice of the person speaking to you and zero in on the person who said your name and listen to their conversation. The cocktail party effect is a great example of your selective attention at work. Selective attention helps us better understand how our minds operate, especially as it relates to mental tasks. Now that you know that you have selective attention, it's important to realize that we're not truly capable of handling multiple tasks simultaneously with equal efficiency. Instead, what we often perceive as multitasking is actually just rapid task switching, where we switch our attention, shifting back and forth between tasks. This constant shifting can lead to reduced performance and increased errors as our cognitive resources are divided. For example, when people try to talk on the phone and type an email, they are not effectively multitasking, but rather task switching, which can lead to lower quality work and longer completion times. Selective attention shows us that focusing on one task at a time is generally more effective and efficient than attempting to juggle multiple tasks. Lastly, sometimes I have students ask how selective attention works in the minds of those who have ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Those who have ADHD have difficulty with selective attention in that instead of filtering out to the unimportant stimuli to focus on the important ones, their minds often attempt to attend to all the stimuli in the environment, making it difficult, if not impossible, to process information effectively. Sometimes it can help to intentionally eliminate or remove some of the excess stimuli that are not important since the mind is unable to block them 
time out, like moving to a quiet place to study with little to no additional sensory information. Now, selective attention does have some unintended consequences, one of which is called inattentional blindness. This is a psychological phenomenon that occurs when individuals fail to notice unexpected objects or events in their environment because their focus is directed elsewhere. Essentially, what this means is while we're concentrating on one task, we completely overlook other visible elements around us. Magicians use inattentional blindness to perform tricks by directing the audience attention to one area, like a particular hand or movement, while secretly executing a trick in the other. For example, by asking the audience to focus on a coin in one hand, the magician can perform a sleight of hand in the other, making the trick seem magical. Pickpockets can exploit this concept by creating distractions to divert the victim's attention away from their belongings. They might engage in a conversation, create a commotion, or bump into them, making the victim less aware of their pockets or their bags, and this is particularly effective in crowded or noisy environments where the victim's attention is overwhelmed by the sensory input and they are focused on navigating unfamiliar situations. This is called inattentional blindness. A more specific form of inattentional blindness is called change blindness. Change blindness happens when we fail to notice a change occur in our environment due to our inattention. For example, suppose a waitress comes to your table. As you are reading over the menu, she says, I'll stop by in a few minutes when you're ready to order. Due to your selective focus on the menu, it's very likely that you would not notice if a different waitress came back to take your order. If this waitress swap happens without your noticing, then you've been affected by change blindness. Since you were focused on determining your meal order, you weren't focused on the details of your waitress. And this is change blindness. So this brings us to the end of today's video lesson. Let's do a few questions for review. I'll read the questions aloud, but not the answers. So pause the video if you need a little extra time to process the response options. I'll share the correct answers at the end of the video. This is question one. A pair of friends at a noisy basketball game are able to have a conversation with each other in spite of all the noise around them. Which principle best explains this scenario? Question number two says, while teaching his students about perceptual sets, what topic would Dr. Krastov most want his students to learn? Question number three says, Dr. Jasper conducted a study in which he asked participants to view a video of a cat playing with yarn and told them to count the number of times the cat rolls the yarn. Halfway through the video, two bulldogs walk behind the cat. After the study, Dr. Jasper asks participants to indicate whether they saw the bulldogs in the video, but few participants reported seeing the bulldogs. What is the dependent variable in this study? Finally, question number four says, on a warm summer day, Kimberly tells her brother to put on a suit. Kimberly's brother knows to put on a swimsuit instead of a business suit because of. This concludes today's video on perception and attention from the 2A series in cognition. Listed on the left-hand side of the screen are the answers to the review questions, and on the right are the questions and concepts. Before closing out, take a moment to check your understanding of these essential elements of today's video.